my name is Megan McAdow. I'm the director at the Marshall M. Frederick Sculpture Museum. And um, we are presenting um, this uh, Hip Hop Icons film speaker series in conjunction with uh, an exhibition that we have both at the museum as well as a very special virtual exhibition online called Hip Hop Icons, um, where over 160 objects, uh, we might even peaked 170 objects. Every time the curator comes in, he sneaks another piece in. So, um, but it is awesome and takes you down memory lane and, um, and gets you singing in your head and all of that. So, um, uh, we're doing the speaker series tonight. I'm going to let our, our collections manager, Jeff, Jeff Haney, um, kick off our um, event this evening. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, and Jeff will give you the details of uh, how it's going to go down tonight. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good evening. Like Megan said, my name is Jeff Haney. I'm the collection manager here at the Marshall M. Frederick Sculpture Museum. Um, welcome to our fourth and final talk in the Hip Hop Icons Film Speaker Series. Um, the series is part of our programming for the exhibition, Hip Hop Icons, which has been a huge success. Um, you can view the exhibition at marshallfredericks.org and uh, just look for the Hip Hop Icons logo and that will take you to the exhibition. Uh, there's a lot to see on there. So uh, you can spend a lot of time on there. Uh, there's videos, there's... Um, 160 some objects. So there's a lot to look at. Um, thanks to the exhibition sponsors, uh, Michigan Humanities, MCACA, um, Saginaw Valley Foundation um, for helping to support this wonderful exhibition. And a special thanks to um, Dr. El Hakim. Um, he is the exhibition curator of hip hop uh, icons. And uh, he is also like we were talking earlier, the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. Um, you can find that at the website uh, below, blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. Uh, the Hip Hop Icons Film Sp Speaker Series is sponsored by uh, the SVSU Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Saginaw African Cultural Festival and the SVSU Foundation. Um, just as a reminder, we're gonna be sending out a short survey for those of you that attended uh, the, the presentation this evening. And please take a moment and fill it out. It's very short and sweet. Your comments are, are very, very important to us. It helps keep our free programs and exhibitions going uh, for, for the museum and we thank you for that. Um, what you're seeing right now is when you register tonight, um, you are going to be entered into a drawing to receive a signed poster um, by Professor Griff of Public Enemy, uh, Umar bin Hassan of uh, The Last Poets, and of course, our, uh, our um, uh, Dr. Uh, El Hakim, the exhibition curator. So uh, one of you, a couple of you might be lucky winners of that. Um, check out our calendar of events on marshallfredericks.org. There's a lot of great programming and things coming up. Uh, so uh, keep your eye on that including uh, a great program coming up this Saturday, February 27th at 12 o'clock noon. DJ Butter, um, great painter, great legend in Detroit hip hop scene. He is going to be doing a hip hop painting class. Um, and so you can register for that on marshallfredericks.org as well to be part of that class. And they're gonna be doing some graffiti style painting. Um, okay, and joining us tonight for the film series Breed and Bootleg Legends of Flint Rap Music are our guest speakers, uh, Jerry Zeldis and Natasha Breed, uh, wife of the late MC Breed. And I should say, uh, um, Dr. Zeldis is also the director of this film. Um, she's a tenured professor at Michigan State University School of Journalism, where she studied, uh, she studies race, gender issues in the news. Um, Dr. Zeldis has a handful of best paper awards as well as more than 100 awards and festival screenings for her documentary films that include regional Emmys, Edward R. Murrow Award, and National Best of Festival Awards from the Broadcast Education Association and Society of Professional Journalists Awards. Um, so we are going to get the conversation started with uh, these wonderful speakers and I want to let you know that we will be monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions, 
uh, feel free to leave uh, your question in there and we will get them out to our speakers. So um, Dr. Zeldis and Natasha, it's all you. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff and Dr. Uh, King, and as well as Megan and Joanna for this opportunity to hang out with Natasha again, uh, because we were able to, to be in a Q&A last uh, week uh, this time, but uh, it's always great to, to meet the great Natasha Breed, who was able to, to make this story happen. Um, and congratulations to Dr. El Hakim for 30 years of his hip hop museum. Um, and it was so wonderful to hear that he's traveling a lot and sharing his um, collection, his massive collection with uh, many on the road and sending it out to the universe. So, uh, so Natasha, uh, how would you like to start this conversation? Um, uh, any, any which way, otherwise I'll, I'll uh, yeah begin by asking you questions, and we can go from there, and and we can hang out as always until Jeff uh, Jeff kind of uh, nudges us a little bit. All right. Well, good evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, guys, for having me. It's such an honor to be a part of this exhibit and to be on this platform with all of these great people, and to be part of this hip hop exhibit. Um, it's been an amazing experience to work with the people involved. And so I'm just here. I hope everyone enjoys the film and um, let's have a good time. And, uh, you know, a reminder that uh, not everybody has had an opportunity to check out the film, but know that uh, you can check it out for the next couple of days and please do so. Uh, and I know it's hard to find time, but it is a good worthwhile, I think, um, 68 minutes or so. Uh, so, you know, circling back to this conversation that we, uh, we had last week, um, Natasha. So Wax, a Wax production, who shared uh, some of the music uh, toward MC Breed's, uh, the, toward the end of his career. Um, he talked about how uh, Bootleg, um, one of his favorite scenes was this passage where Bootleg is in the community and going down Dayton Ave, uh, now Dayton Street. And so he's giving us a tour and talking through and then he stops because somebody, somebody on the street um, notices him. And, and really that's what it was kind of like that day. He stopped and gave people time. Um, and that was one of Wax's um, who was a producer, uh, one of his favorite moments of the film, but I haven't even asked you, like, what are your favorite moments of the film? I love the entire film. I was really surprised and excited to see so much original footage from high school talent shows and different events in the area that I was able to be a part of. Those are literally my experiences. Those are the times from when I was in school and I participated in a lot of those events, as well as the majority of probably 95% of the people that were a part of the film or interviewed were my classmates or my former neighbors or people that I hung out with and played with when I was a kid or a teenager. And so all of the parts for me were extremely good and just, um, it was just super recognizable, I guess, you know, just like, I know him, I know her, oh my God, they're so-and-so. And it was, it was a true testament to the people of Flint and how we are when we see one another, no matter where we are. Um, we're very well grounded, we're full of humility, we're humble people. And so we never forget who we are, where we come from, or the people we know. And so you'll see in the film, uh, Bootleg was approached by someone in his old neighborhood, literally name basis, one-on-one. -on -one. And, you know, we're, we're still the same people that we grew up with. And so um, that was a big thing that I think people will learn about Breed from the film as well, is how humble he was. Mm -hmm. and he's like can, I, can I actually jump in and I'm um, just based off of something that came in via chat is um, uh, either of you or maybe Natasha um, talk about literally even what time frame are we talking about? You know, are we talking about 80s, 90s? Um, you know, what was the hip hop scene um, that um, that y'all were living? And, um, you know, just a little context, uh, even just, you know, about what time to kind of frame of reference for us. 
for me personally, I'm a high school graduate, 1990. So that era, anywhere from kind of like middle school, you know, seventh, eighth grade, all the way up. Um, I do remember during that time was kind of like, we were the culture that embraced and were um, the beginning of hip hop, I guess you could say. When all of the concerts would come through the area, you had baby girl productions and you had a lot of these big shows, Fat Boys, Public Enemy, Salt and Pepper, and they would come to places like um, the Saginaw Civic Center or Joe Louis Arena. And so that was my era, that was my time. So I would say anywhere from probably 87, you know, 86 kind of up, um, we were teenagers. And, an actor, but literally we got to see and embrace that beginning of hip hop, so to speak. And uh, and just a follow up question again from someone in our um, in our audience who is uh, self proclaimed Motown era uh, is is could one of you just you know do a, a quick. It's, you know, like, like we said, there's over 160 objects in this exhibition on hip hop. It's a, a wide and diverse and ever evolving genre, but, um, but maybe even just for kind of the type of hip hop we're talking about here in Flint at that time, um, how, how could we describe that to someone who's kind of, you know, uh, self, self-described as the Motown era? Do you mean like what are some of the artifacts or some of the things that one might see in the exhibit? I would say like the uh, to describe the music, you know, like. Uh... Oh, well, for me, my experience with the music, um, not only did we get to experience the hardcore hip, um, hip hop and the new introduction to rap music and storytelling through rhyme, we also got to um, literally hear a lot of the sampling in music and the George Clintons and the Motown sounds and a lot of the R&B um, you don't get to hear that as much in music anymore today, but we got to literally kind of um, experience the transition, I would say, from one genre to another. And a lot of that was literally incorporated in the music, a lot of the funk, as well as some of the R&B samples and Motown sounds too. Yeah, so there is that connection to those Motown sounds were being infused and sampled into the music back then, which is awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll t- keep going. <laughs> so, like, can I uh, uh, tap Please. in a little bit? And I, and I also want to like uh, send over the baton to uh, Dr. El Hakim because this is his universe. But uh, when you think about uh, the kind of music that was occurring in the mid 1980s, I mean, you think of Ready for the World. Uh, and they were a group that were so, I mean, they were so like Prince-like in, in their tunes and very much so this Midwestern genre of music um, used the, the sounds of Prince. Um, and then you'll hear, like Natasha mentioned, the sampling from Ohio players and the sampling from, um, uh, from Parliament. And it, um, it was this groovy, funkadelic, um, really more R&B rap music. Um, but you also had very, um, very shortly after that period. In 19, so MC Breed um, broke records. He made it on the national scene in 91. And then at 92, you begin to see this, this upward transformation of this, the independent uh, uh, gangsta music that's represented by Bootleg and the Dayton family and Top Authority. Um, that is much, um, that was, it was much more rapid in pace, much more hardcore in um, topic. So you've got this infusion of these two competing types of genres, one funk and one very hardcore rap that, um, you know, really, uh, had made its roots in Flint. So, you know, the, the, basis or what I what I'm trying to excavate in this film is that you know what all a lot of those roots like began in Motown and began in Flint in fact that's how this all started was that I found a a scholarly article that that gave a nod to MC Breed as really um, laying the foundation of hip-hop music even before um, Eminem and Kid Rock. Um, So I really want to, you know, underscore that, yeah, you know, Motown, um, definitely a place for sure. 
Um, but Flint also needs its due in terms of, of uh, having a say in, in the history of the rap music genre. And so Dr. al Hakim, if you want to answer that question a little bit better about you know what um, how uh, what is hip hop um, and specifically what is hip hop in in mid Michigan and and some of the the ties it has to Detroit, um, please do. And, and he may or may not be with us this entire time. Um, I think he's got to be in an in and out a little bit. Um, but that, um, you know, I grew up in Michigan and to me, you know, thinking about, you know, Detroit, Motown, Parliament Funkadelic, and then, you know, this, this Flint rap that's coming on the scene. I think that you did a great job of kind of, you know, showing that, you know, dichotomy and, um, and, and that, that early stages of that really, you know, the hardcore and the gangster rap um, genre really coming out strong from, um, you know, I wonder, uh, Natasha, if you can, you know, how nationally, um, I don't know how much Flint as a city was on the radar, but definitely these artists, they made it, you know, they were, they became nationally known, important. Um, you could talk a little bit about that. Um, thank you for mentioning that. That's a great point. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because not only did Bree have an amazing commercial success as far as radio and in the hip hop music industry, there are quite a few Flint artists that really are on the map and have made great names for themselves, not just like in Atlanta on the music scene, but California you know, pretty much across the whole map. And um, I can say I've been to malls and events and I've, I've literally been places where I've heard people in the parking lot riding by playing Jake the Flake or Top Authority. <laughs> or, you know, when people say, hey, where are you from? And I tell them I'm from Flint. And then they'll ask me about people like Mama Soul or Lyric the Queen or, you know, Dayton family. There are so many people and then you still have current rappers like Tony Valley and so many people that have carried the torch on to other cities and still just, you know, ride for the city and represent the name extremely well. But as far as um, my personal experiences, when I first moved to Atlanta, probably about 27, 28 years ago, there was a time when you would travel across the United States and people would say, where are you from? And you would say Michigan and they would say, oh, Detroit. And you'd say, well, no, I'm from a little town north of Detroit. And now immediately they'll say, where are you from? And you say Flint. And they'll say, oh, my God, I know someone from there. I met someone from there or I love this group or that group. And so there's literally now a connection, I would say, to almost, you know, just about any person, any type of social class, any type of music fan um, across pretty much every state in the United States. I think we've made our mark by now. So Natasha, can you give us a sense for some of the people that don't know? Um, tell us about Breed. Tell us about his life. Well, Breed was um, the youngest child of uh, four or five. He grew up in the Flint area on the north side of Flint. And um, he was, I wouldn't say a wild child, but he was just one of those kids that had a lot of energy. He was always kind of what you would say, roaming the neighborhoods or looking for something to get into, just kind of having fun. And he was a, he liked to beatbox. Before he was a rapper, he would beatbox. So he was known in high school as the kid that would beatbox in the hallways and get expelled from school and things like that. And so yeah. without telling too much from the film, but basically that's what it was. He started beatboxing. He had a desire for rap and rap music. And he had a knack for it and he just chased his dreams and he met some people out of Saginaw. They took him down to Atlanta and he was able to just find a good situation and sign a deal. And so from there, once he made it to the Atlanta area and he's now in the middle of a record deal, he's now able to work with other people from other areas. And so that's another part of his career that he's known for, um, for bringing a lot of different areas together, like the two shorts out of Oakland and, you know, the Eric Sermons out of the New York area. So he kind of brought the brotherhood to the South and um, connected a lot of rappers in the industry 
who still really work together and are good friends to this day. But he just had that rough and tough, you know, that every stereotype, you're not going to make it. You can't do this. Midwest doesn't have a lane for music. He broke a lot of those barriers down and was a pioneer for one of the first. How, how did he meet Too Short? I noticed him in the, in the movie. I was a little bit surprised. I was like, wow, here's a guy I haven't seen in years, you know, and like all of a sudden here's Too Short, you know, and I'm like, I wouldn't have recognized him. But like, what was that relationship? How did that come to be? Well, I don't know exactly like where and what, when they met, but I will say that if you're not literally a Flint native or you don't know the true story of Breed, there are many, many people that think he's actually from California. And I think it had a lot to do with his sound and the samples of music. And so he was very well received in the Bay Area by people like E-40 and Short. And they gravitated to him. And again, the humility, just being so humble and a regular person, he would meet these people and they would be like best friends. And so the Too Short interview was actually just a scratch of the surface of some of the names and the interviews that we kind of have on B-roll and, and additional footage and things like that. But um, yes, Breed was extremely, he didn't just work with other rappers, um, they were friends. And so I don't want to spoil it, but I think Jerry can kind of step in and tell you some of the things that she learned um, as far as the industry side um, of his character. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I am learning constantly. I, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to work on this film about uh, rap and hip hop is because this, this is something that uh, was a huge void. I, I mean, I grew up in Flint, but um, was very sheltered and the sounds of MC Breed and Ready for the World were in my periphery but um, didn't have access because I was, you know, we, I was really in this very strict Filipino American household, but um, saw it as an opportunity to, to really learn um, about this amazing person who has like this, the, these connections um, that at a time, you know, you have to always think in context that this is not a time of social media, but somebody he was able to, to really compress like um, time and geography. And yes, and I, and, and I nod when I, when I say that, um, yeah, a lot of people don't know that he's from Flint. Um, and they're like, oh, I think I, he was one of my favorite Detroit rappers. Not like he wasn't from Detroit. He was actually from Flint. Um, and so that's like surprising for them. Right. But uh, just in terms of the sound, uh, no, I'm just, lear uh, just uh, learning a lot about Breed's contribution. And, and in the film, you see also this um, audible transformation in his music. And that's, uh, really one of the gifts of the film is that Natasha was able to connect me with John Wax and, and Wax uh, gave me access to three songs that have never been heard before um, and are remarkably so different than uh, his early work, MC Breed's early work. And so you think about the success of Little Nas X and his his crossing of genres into country. Um, here you hear MC Breed, who is very funky, um, get into a little rock and roll and get into a little like um, country in, in his very last songs. And, and so, um, wow, it's just a, just a, 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 a sentence about, I mean, an artist is an artist. Um, and you can cross artistry lines and genres, and, and that's what he did. He was that good, um, where he could do the funk and the R&B and, and then also be this credible, incredible rock singer, like toward the end of his life. So uh, that was amazing for me to, to witness. Um, and I hope that y'all who haven't seen the film get... Um, get an opportunity to, to watch it because it's like, whoa, when you hear um, MC Breed um, shortly before he passed, it is, uh, it is a ride um, because it is so, so musical and so different, um, but it's, it's the same very talented individual. 
So that was kind of crazy and, and interesting for me. You know, I think I was really uh, surprised when I heard that rock and roll country uh, come through. And I was like, was this going to be a direction that he probably would have followed, you know? Um, and, and what what brought him to, to do that? It, it was incredible. And one of the things that it makes me think of, uh, Natasha, as you're talking about, you know, the humility and humbleness and going around and, and meeting people and becoming friends. But to me, that almost also sounds like there had to be a certain um, level of confidence to break, you know, break genres. So, you know, to go in such a new, bold and different direction, there's, there's also had to also been this, for sure, this inner confidence that uh, I don't have to sit and follow the mold. I can keep, advancing and changing and experimenting sounds like well it, that's great that you said that and it kind of piggybacks to the last question that Jeff had about what made him do that type of music and I think the one thing about Breed was a little bit opposite of what you would think about him having the confidence and being able to kind of break the molds and do what he wanted to do um the country music and the singing and things like that from the R&B nature those were things and qualities that he actually um Long before he was a rapper, his brothers and sisters were, you know, he'd come from a musical singing family. And so his sister is extremely talented um, vocally and his brother was amazingly talented vocally. And so Breed would often sing around the house and, and have this R&B sound. And there's some songs and some music from years ago that you can hear some of the vocals in the back, you can hear it a little bit. However, during his time, singing wasn't, cool, so to speak, the R&B wasn't in the rap because as you guys stated, rap was during the time it was trying to transition into groups like NWA and Dayton Family. And they were speaking more of hardcore things and political things. And so he would get laughed at for singing and, oh, you're gonna be a singer, oh, you sing or you rap, you know, that ain't cool. And so he would suppress that for many, many years and hold back. And only the closest family and friends would get to hear it or know it. And we would always say, you should do like a double CD and oh God, you can sing so well. You know, our daughter gets her gift of singing from him. So right before his death, I think that that was during the time, um, you know, Jay-Z had done it with Linkin Park and then you had your Kid Rocks and, and it was more accepted and a lot more in the industry um, by that time. And so he was recording some phenomenal material and he was really feeling great about it. And I think the more he played it for other people, it built his confidence and he was really looking forward um, to releasing this, shocking a lot of people with his, um, his comeback. And, and with the lyrics and things that he was talking about, he wasn't talking about your average rap subject. He was more in a political frame of mind and had experienced a lot of growth. And so the material is, it's amazing. It's amazing. I was like, is, is he gonna be on a CMA, Country Music Awards someday, <laughs> you know? And uh, then what would his following have thought about that, you know? And like, wow, here's, here's MC Breed and he's, he's playing this great country music, you know? Right. Um, one thing that I really found interesting was his really closeness with Tupac. Uh, I guess that's something I didn't know. Can you talk to us a little bit about that relationship? Sure. Um, actually, his, him and Pac were extremely close. And what a lot of people don't really know is that uh, when Tupac and Breed actually met one another, Pac was an extreme fan of MC Breed. So he was an awe of breed. He just really, really, you know, he he was a fan and he'd come down to Atlanta and they'd work together. You know, breed wanted to put him on some music and stuff. And so they recorded recorded quite a bit of material here in Atlanta. Some of it was released on one of breeds albums. You hear got to get mine, got to get yours and stuff like that. But I think one of the reasons why they became so close more of personal friends as opposed to just work buddies their birthdays was like literally two to three days apart. Um, they had the intellectual side. You know, a lot of people have that stereotype of rappers or just kind of like street thugs or just, you know, it, it's not just I want to make, you know, words rhyme. 
a lot of rappers are extremely intelligent, intellectual people, they're readers, um, they're really deep with their thought. And so that's how a lot of that gets to paper and to the music. But Tupac was one of those people. Um, they're both Gemini. And it's hard to explain, but they were, they were extremely close. It was kind of like when they weren't together, they were off on other ends of this, the map doing their own thing. But when they got together, it was like they had never been apart ever. And so I'm sure they had a lot of fun and some long nights partying. <laughs> Jerry, um, what, what originally, um, you know, sparked your interest to create this film and how long of a project was this for you? And also, was there enough archival information that you could, you know, to, to get to actually you know, put this all together? I mean, and where did you find some of the sources and uh, stuff like that? Oh, goodness. So um, that's a, you know, part um, of working on a project is, is that you want to fill a void. And really that article that I referenced earlier that uh, drove me to this, this project was uh, the only scholarly article that was available that looked at uh, the contributions of Flint hip hop, specifically MC Breed. And out of this like two volume anthology about hip hop music, you have these two paragraphs about MC Breed and the contribution of Flint. So uh, no, uh, so that's why I was interested in it is like, oh, you know what? Here's, a, here's an oppor opportunity to contribute to, to uh, ethnographic filmmaking as well as a history of Flynn because uh, uh, it is not well known except for um, a, a lot of, I mean, so there was a lot written in MLive and, and some in the New York Times and a little bit of the Detroit Free Press about MC Breed, um, but, but hip hop um, analysis and, and musical genre um, as a scholarly um, fo foci is, is, is really new because uh, uh, in the academy, so I, I, I felt like, okay, um, let me talk to people and, and um, let me find stuff. And, and you know, stuff comes um, through a combination of, of just digging and, and um, sending out the big, uh, uh, the, the big net of sorts. And you hope that uh, individuals contribute. Some of, um, some of the stuff you see is from Natasha. Um, uh, a lot of it uh, was courtesy of of uh, the Dane family, uh, specifically a bootleg, because he, you know, speaking about his access, he was like, you know what, you can use whatever. Um, what you won't see in the film, though, is uh, any of the music of MC Breed, which is really, um, uh, you know, a tragedy, uh, just because I, I could not get access of permission or copyright um, for his work. Um, so that's uh, that. That's like one of the things that is, is you know, is, is missing from the film. But I, I hope that that it's made up a little bit um, when you see the end of the film, because you do hear some um, some of "Ain't No Future in Your Front" uh, at the very end, vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, Lexi Breed. But uh, no, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of searching and and hoping that you get. Um, permission from people to use this stuff in the film. Natasha, I had another thing that I picked up in the film I thought was really wonderful is that uh, the generous nature of Breed, um, you know, when he talked about, you know, if he got something, you got something. And, and I mean, that's such a great thing, but man, that can really be a downfall at some point too. So, um, Talk to us about like that. That's a, such a rare thing these days, that extreme generosity. Absolutely. You, you found that quite a bit during that time with a lot of the rappers, even with the athletes. You would hear the stories of people making it big and making out of their hometown and the family and friends come along for the ride or they just kind of take care of people and do things out of the kindness or their heart or even guilt sometimes. But it is absolutely a, a downfall and it's a sacrifice in so many ways. And a lot of times people don't understand um, the sacrifices that are made. You know, not only do they help out people financially, but 
every moment that's spent on the road or on a tour or downstairs in the studio hanging out with your homeboys, that's time away from your kids and your family and focusing and your business and things like that. So um, Bree definitely was um, one of the people who he gave a lot. You know, I, I'd like to say he pretty much gave it all. But he gave a lot. He gave a lot to friends and family and he gave a lot of opportunity. He gave a lot of money. He just opened his home and he didn't just open his home and let you stay there for like three days or on a weekend visit. You know, people would come and move in and be there for months or years. He would send money home for child support or, you know, when he bought shoes, he bought everyone's shoes. And I remember a time in our home when our daughter was younger, I remember coming through the living room one morning and literally counting 13 people laying around sleeping on the floors, you know, sitting in chairs, watching TV. So, you know, um, there is a good and a bad to the industry and to that type of lifestyle. And it definitely, um, it takes away from you. You feel so many obligations to people out of love and loyalty. And the hardest part of it is when you have that story like MC Breeds and, you know, he doesn't have the happy ending like Bootleg had, you know, they both kind of fell into the same trap. But Breed ultimately, you know, he lost his life to the industry. And so that's when you find out that those people aren't there, you know. And so, you know, that's just part of what it is. And this is what we go through. But you'll see a lot of that in the film. And, and it's a good thing to see that not only do you have other rappers or professional people um, in, in different places of their career, it seems like no matter what they say about Breed, they all kind of say the same thing. Oh, he just gave, he gave, he gave, and he was such a good guy. And so for me, that's one of my um, proudest moments is to hear so many people say the same thing about his inner character as opposed to um, the physical work that he left behind. It's kind of sad, you know, um, one thing I've learned through this exhibition is so many of the greats seem to pass away at the same time. You know, Jay Dilla, Proof, uh, Batin from you know, Slum Village and, and, and of course Breed, uh, all relatively went within a close period of each other. And I was, I was driving home today and I thought, what, what would it be like if those guys were together today? What would they have made? You know, what kind of music would they have made together? Um, but we, we probably missed a lot. So on that, who are some of the biggest people that have been that are around today that you think have drawn their influence from Breed? I would say, um, as far as the Flint area, I definitely would name John Connor, Tony Valley, um, Lyric the Queen. I think that there are a lot of Midwest groups and rappers, you know, they, they but one thing about Breed, he definitely had a great influence on other people, but he had mm -hmm. such an original style and an original voice. It's kind of hard to copy that. But I do think as a collective, I think the Midwest as a collective, we have our own style. And that's something that is really um, a strong point in hip hop and in the music today. People can hear our music or hear a certain sound and kind of know it's a Midwest sound as opposed to L.A. or New York or Atlanta. And I think that's really interesting. And I think that that started from the breeds and the Dayton families. And, you know, we're really real. We're not scared to rap about the hardcore things that are happening in our communities. And so um, a lot of it is just real genuine. Um, it's, it's a really raw sound, um, but it sticks with you. You know, I was thinking today, too, uh, I grew up in Saginaw, and, and my family all were General Motors workers, you know, just like in Flint, you know, and so the, the people like around Breed's time period, I mean, Flint had already in Saginaw, the factories had shut down and all that kind of stuff. But they, before that, they had come from their grandparents and maybe their parents had great prosperity when they, everybody had an auto job and then to see it all just crumble. Um, what was the, how did that influence Flint's hip hop sound? I think the um, breakdown of everything definitely left an impact on the sound because it left an impact on the people who were creating the sound. 
we were the teenagers and the young adults who had grown up in those general motor households. We were the kids whose parents were laid off and we were now experiencing poverty and sacrificing so many things from the household at that level. And so you'll hear that in the sounds of Jake the Flake. You'll hear that in the sounds of Ira Dorsey where they would have to go out on the corner. And, and you know, that was at our turning point in our life where a lot of kids our age took over and they went out in the streets to hustle to take care of the household. Our parents couldn't do it during that time. And so you get to hear a lot of that in the sound. You'll hear some struggling, you'll hear some anxiety, you'll hear some good and some bad, but you'll always, I think, hear the resilience and the triumph in the end, and they just don't stop. I mean, there's groups, NFTP and Took and Bone, the list goes on and on, you know, ready for the world. Um, if you just kind of stop and listen, um, top authority, great material. There's so much through the sounds and the lyrics of what we actually went through. Jerry, what was your time like spent with bootleg? You know, I mean, uh, were you in the car with him in the scene that you were filming? Um, uh, what what was he like, really? I mean, did, did you got to obviously spend quite a bit of time with him. He he comes off as this very bright, intellectual, knowledgeable character about like Flint and everything, and you know, he just he's a guy you want to sit and have a beer with or something. Yeah, you know what? He 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 is. Uh, what you see is what you get. He's a brilliant individual uh, and uh, super engaging, and that's what attracts you and, and drives you in, in filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, these stories are character driven um, by people who are able to capture the audience, right? And and so he is um, as engaging interpersonally as uh, as he is. Um, in a concert, uh, just mesmerizing how smart and intellectual um, he is. Uh, so it was it was just a real easy time. And I, you know, I I had uh, the the DP and some of the members of the crew who were like, "Oh my gosh, is that is this is this Ira Dorsey?" And I'm like, "Yeah," because they had, they had grown up with uh, his music too, and and we were just in awe because we were. We were just hanging out, and it and it was just uh, so comfortable for all of us. And that's what and that's who he is. And same with Natasha. Um, Natasha is an incredibly engaging individual, and so that's what you bank your your stories on uh, that that these characters carry and and allow you to um, be very honest about what they're thinking about. And and so that's uh, what really made the film is that. They are who they are um, in the film, truly. Oh yes, I, there's no makeup, there's no glitz and glam, there's no hair and makeup team, there's no production set, there's no cut the mic, let's start over. You're gonna get raw emotional tears, laughs, you're gonna get raw footage. It's it's not um, it's not practice rehearse or anything. It's definitely genuine and um, it's real. Yeah, somebody that's asked, um, there, uh, somebody, uh, one of the, the, the guests here had asked a question. Um, what happened to the documentary that Breed was about to release called Where is MC Breed? And so, Natasha, do you know the, the answer to that? A little bit. I know shortly before his passing, um, it's kind of a two part question. So a couple of years before he'd gotten sick and passed away, he had been dealing with a management company in the Ann Arbor area. And they were following him with a camera crew and um, because he had been going through a lot of legal issues and things like that. And of course, recording this material and trying to make a comeback. So they were filming him and he was wanting to do his own documentary because he'd been away from the industry for a few years. And so um, when he passed away, there was a little bit of footage probably up until just a few months before he passed away. I think one of the last dates might have been the BET after party here in Atlanta. Um, I remember the camera crew being there. Um, and so the person that probably has the majority of that footage is actually um, one of the people that's in the film, um, Daryl Morris. And so um, I think just with every um, 
bit of material as with the music and footage and so many different things that Breed left behind because his catalog is amazing and his material and there's just so much. But I think out of respect to the family and to um, his kids, which are the legal heirs of his estate, as Jerry mentioned, there's so many issues with copywriting and licensing and things like that. I think people like Daryl and even myself, some of the things that we have, we've kind of held out on certain situations, you know, until we can really straighten out the legalities of it to make sure that his, his heirs actually benefit from um, his material and his intellectual properties. So yeah, when you talk to Sam, I tried to get access to some of the footage, um, but was not able to do so. And, and um, before we jumped on um, live tonight, you know, there, there, you guys were discussing a little bit about um, some footage that didn't um, make it into this uh, iteration of the of the film that we're talking about tonight. Um, and, um, you know, I am naive into all of those legalities and copyrights. I mean, that stuff, it, I have tried to look into that kind of stuff. It is complicated. And, um, but wow, um, uh, this, uh, this interview that you're taught that you were talking about of breed, um, you know, if there was a way to, um, to even, you know, like, of course we would be honored and love to be able to share it as part of the virtual exhibition, fully copyrighted and, you know, um, to, to, to get that out there. But um, I knew, you know, um, Jerry, you're a professor, uh, the Marshall and Frederick Sculpture Museum is part of Saginaw Valley State University. We have a lot of students following tonight um, on Facebook Live. And, and, um, and so, Jerry, I just wondered if you could, um, you know, um, briefly talk about, um, you know, you, you, you both started talking about, you know, the documentary um, film process and how different it is. Natasha was talking about, you know, there's no makeup, there's no lights, there's no, um, you know, double takes and things like that. And Jerry, I'm sure that you do try to do some sort of storyboarding, you know, and concept as you embark on a project like this, but wow, to, to you know, you've got to be, you know, spontaneous and um, open to possibilities. So just having made, you know, so many documentary films, Jerry, could you share with, um, you know, some of these budding um, filmmakers, uh, our students, uh, just a little bit about that process and maybe some, some tips to, um, you know, things that you didn't know about um, making documentaries before going into it. And now you've lived it and you know um, that, uh, you know, there, there are things that you could help others with. Oh yeah, so uh, I am uh, of a line. There, there are several different lines of social documentary filmmakers. And uh, um, one line, because documentary filmmaking is the creative interpretation of reality, right? Uh, so I'm very much, a, I'm a journalist. I, I don't redo interviews. I um, make sure that things are really have a, a, a really authentic um, presentation. Um, but there is a more fictional kind of documentary filmmaking um, that uh, is, you know, very comfortable with, with reconstruction, very comfortable with um, redoing interviews and reenacting, et cetera. So, so th there are those uh, two branches. Um, in my branch, which is totally social journalism, documentary filmmaking, um, things evolve and sometimes you, your story arc has to evolve with it. And, and so as Natasha knows, this, this is a project that was very general, very broad and did not start um, morphing until you get the interviews. And that's what happens. And yeah, it does, it, it does take a long time. And I forget to, to answer Jeff's question directly, but now this idea came in 2017 at, at a Michigan Humanities Conference 
Um, and there was somebody sitting right next to me who was working on a documentary film about, about Grand Rapids and we got into a conversation. And, and so in short, um, I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. It took me a couple cycles to get the funding um, through the Michigan Humanities Council. And I noticed that they're a funder of um, the hip hop icons exhibit as well. And so uh, they're really wonderful partners. And so you have to have that in place. That's, what, that's part of the, the recipe. But um, what ultimately, in, and yeah, it's, a, it's surprising. Some of my films um, have taken five, six years to make. Um, this film, 2017, I started really working on it 2018. That's when I contacted Natasha. I didn't get to interview Natasha until 2019. Um, but no, you, you know, it's, it's like a... It, it, it's like this huge or organic process. And the longer it simmers, the, the better it gets. Um, but, and so you, and, and because that's what I do, it, it just takes time because you, you look up and you verify and you make sure that, yes, it, you know, this is what happened. And, and then, you know, what's remarkable about um, this film and other films is that people have such great memories of what happened um, 20 years ago uh, versus what happened two days ago, right? I mean, these, these are astounding um, recollections that uh, you get and, are, and I'm, just, uh, I'm, I'm just surprised every single time that I interview people is that, wow, it does match up to the other archival research that I'm looking at and, and boom, um, that's the presentation. That, that is like authentic anthropological, like, documentary filmmaking in that it happened it was real but with some like real life flavor <laughs> you know besides yeah it's, it's a lot of work <laughs> and um yeah it, it, it's all a lot of work but it's fun and I'm sorry that um yeah my uh my third child just arrived so uh, yeah a lot of like uh extraneous um sound in the background. I apologize for that. We just got a new puppy. So that's, <laughs> that's what you heard in the background. Um, but all of it, you know, you, you, life, you just juggle and, and things really worked out. Uh, well, actually didn't work out with COVID, but, but goodness, uh, here we are talking about the film with Natasha, who's in Atlanta, and you all who are in Flint and Saginaw. So I, I, yeah, this is a, this is a great thing. Anybody have any questions? Um, one other thing, Natasha, did you see the uh, the painting by DJ Butter of Breed on the website? I did. I actually follow him on Instagram. I'm a fan of DJ Butter being from Michigan, of course. Um, and so I actually also run um, the MC Breed fan page on Instagram. And a lot of times I'm searching for content or people will submit things to me to put on the fan page. But yes, I saw that. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. He sent me a painting. I, I had asked him when we had a, an interview when he was on, I think, for the very first of the hip hop um, film speaker series. And he said, what, what, who do you want me to make a painting of? And I, I was like thinking real quick. And I'm like, uh, how about Bushwick Bill from Ghetto Boys? And like a week later, I've got this big painting. And I'm like, wow, you know, what a great guy. I love it. I noticed in the exhibit when I saw the virtual, I took the virtual tour and there's several of his pieces there. So yes, I didn't know he'd done so many. Yeah, great. He's going to be doing Saturday. He's going to be doing a painting class. So oh, awesome. Virtual painting class. So that'll be really fun. Oh, that's going to be real nice. Yeah. yeah. So any future like um, uh, the breeds, your, your children, do they got any potential uh, musical stars there horizon or? Well, yes. Uh, Breed's daughter, Lexi Breed, she's a singer, a vocalist, so she's pursuing a music career. She took a break for a while, but she's back at it just recently, so we're excited about that. And um, for those that are watching the film, at the end of the film, you'll get to see a short video of her um, doing the remake of Ain't No Future, and that's actually after the credits. So um, she has a quite a bit of material. And then um, his oldest son, Marco Breed, he's 21 now, and he just recently got into a lot of um, music. He's more of the production side. So he likes to produce tracks and things. And he's real heavy into vinyl and stuff like that. So he's getting back into a lot of the old school and the sampling and stuff like that. So music is just a part of our household. I just can't get away from it. <laughs> you know, since we've had this exhibition, there's one thing that I, 
that is like uh, kind of blowing my mind a little bit. Um, but a lot of the kids today that come in that are college age, they look at these past 50 years of hip hop icons, uh, memorabilia, and they have no idea who it is. It's kind of like when I was a kid and my mom brought out her Elvis stuff, you know, and I'm like, I don't know what that is. I mean, and so many of the kids today that have come through, they have no idea who James Brown is. You know, it, they've never heard of uh, one of the very first concerts I attended as a kid. I was like 13 at the Saginaw Civic Center. I got to see Parliament Funkadelic. So as a 13 year old white kid, you're like, oh my God, right. you know, it's you for the rest of your life. You can't, you can't deny you were part of that, you know, right. but some of these kids today, they have no idea, you know, that they never heard rappers delight. They've never heard a public enemy. Um, and that just, that kind of blows my mind, you know. Um, it's really disheartening. It's kind of like a disconnect and you're right. I just watched a documentary yesterday um, and it was related to the Whitney Houston story. And there was a young lady, she was Bobby Christina's friend. And she said, uh, Whitney came to pick up Bobby and there's this lady in my driveway and it was Whitney Houston and I had no idea who she was. And I'm like, you didn't know who Whitney Houston was? But we're in that, we're in that day and age of everything is just so social media and digital and everything's from home. And it's kind of like a disconnect where our parents would get in the living room or the basement or they'd dance together or have backyard cookouts. And we'd get to hear the old school and the Temptations and the James Brown. And we got to grow up on that. So we got to appreciate it a little bit more than what I think they do. And it's really sad that... Um, for me, I think the sad part is that the rap industry and a lot of the young rap artists, they are thriving so much today and they are extremely successful and they're making millions and millions of dollars. And I think one reason why is because a lot of the old school rappers, you know, they paved the way and they took a lot of hits and they had to learn the game about residuals and intellectual property and copyrights and publishing. And so, you know, a lot of those people sacrificed masters and, and money and things like that, you know, and a lot of that business didn't get worked out until the later years. And so the new rappers are able to literally benefit from these things that happen in the industry. And they don't even have a clue like what the foundation was and, and who the material came from. And so sometimes that's the sad part because you know, you're like, you just don't know what you're missing. And it's such a, you know, like we were talking about earlier, such a difference with, you know, the early, some of the early hip hop and all the sampling that it was so connected to you know what the parents were listening to and what the aunts and uncles were listening to and and um and so yeah it, it but you know I, I try to remember when we were just talking to somebody the other day it's like well I don't I don't know what the kids are listening to so you know it's like it's right. a perpetual it's a perpetual thing that's been going on for generations and generations where we, we talk about, you know, the kids don't know and they talk about, we don't know, but um, you know, yeah, no, there it's um, definitely, you know, there were so many that paved the way um, like you're talking about with like, you know, intellectual property and residuals. I mean, the people in Motown and what they have gone through where they, you know, don't get pennies for, you know, what, what they did. And the, the, it, it's, it's standing on everybody's shoulders and just, you know, it, important to think about and recognize. And, and maybe that is, you know, yet another reason why exhibitions like this are important is Absolutely. so that we do make, help make those connections and help people say, oh yeah, it, this is where it started. Oh, now I see the connection between that then and now. And um, yeah, it, it was weird. Cause it, like Jeff said, it blew my mind when we were first bringing college kids through the exhibition. And I just, there were, you know, I mean, even things like MC Hammer, like they didn't know. And so it was like, you know, um, things that I think are like modern, you know, new and modern. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, you know, they're not even like old school, you know, they're just, and, um, but no, it's, it, I, I do think that it's, it's important that we, you know, and again, this is during Black History Month, 
And so, you know, recognizing all of the different ways those who came before us paved the way, fought the battles, learned lessons so that those today doing what they do and those making money off of it, let's, you know, give respect and um, acknowledgement to those that came before Right. I just like to add ex exactly what you said is so important in that, you know, I think as with anything in life, I think it's only right that we just salute the legends, but especially with rap music, you know, rap music is not just, again, words that are rhyming. If you go and do your rap history, there were so many rap and hip hop groups that were political, you know, political and so many people, even like with the police and you had Ice-T and NWA and Public Enemy. And so that's one of the most important things about this exhibit. Um, it, it's not like you're going to go in there and hear rap music or you're going to push a recorder and hear songs. You're going to see posters. You're going to see artifacts. You're going to see items from a genre where, you know, people may have literally went to Freak Nick or Jack the Rapper and snatched a poster off a telephone pole. These are literal objects, you know, from that hip hop era. And so, you know, it would be a little bit better if some of the younger people could kind of, you know, know what it was or learn about it or know some of the meanings behind the artifacts because it's an amazing exhibit yeah and, and you know uh, praise to uh dr al hakim because not only is he the curator he has collected all of these each and every single one of these 170 items just in this hip-hop exhibition and of course he's been collecting for 30 years and his collection you know is uh goes you know, Black History 101 goes well beyond hip hop. And, um, you know, to collect that history, to honor that history. Um, and, and, you know, to me, there are so many things in this exhibition that make me, you know, there's a lunchbox, you know, at the, you know, bring up MC Hammer again, but there's like a plastic lunchbox with MC Hammer. And it's like, things that were part of my life are part of history now, you know, and, Absolutely. and so it's um, getting that mindset, you know, even, you know, the younger generations today saying, you know, what are we making today that could be part of history in the future and, and, and have that be part of our consciousness, you know, right. I agree. What's, you know, you guys, thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any questions? Joanna, any questions coming in from Facebook Live? What, one of the great things is that this is going to, um, of course, be recorded and available okay. on Facebook Live. I think a lot of people have taken advantage of the um, register to get to see the documentary, to have access to that film for free. So that's awesome. And um, so I know that they'll be, those people will be spreading the word. Any other questions come in, Jeff? Not that I conceive. Um, yeah. We got quiet, quiet people tonight. Um, yeah. Jerry and Natasha, we would love for you to share any final words, thoughts um, that you want to share. Yeah, so uh, I, I have my little list here. Um, Good. <laughs> prepared, pre prepared professor. <laughs> school, school us, professor. <laughs> All right. Well, I not talking points, but uh, you know, I, like I like to say all the time, is that documentary filmmaking is a group sport, and so I just want to want to give my claps out to my crew who have, uh, yeah, hung hung out and tried to tell this story with me for several years, and and that's Andrea Raby over in Chicago now. She's a documentary filmmaker, and then Olivia Hoover, who's now uh, working production on a new TV show. So that's pretty cool. And then Natasha, of course, is one of the co-producers. But uh, yeah, a whole crew uh, who I want to thank: videographers Adam Bussell, Ben Goldman, Kishan Terrell, Gilliam, uh, Anderson, Ashley Conklin, Lauren. Crimes, Evan Cuts, Rohan Macheka, and Faye Kolig, and of, of course, all the funders, uh, Michigan Humanities 
Council being the main funder of this film, as well as Michigan State University. So just really blessed um, to tell these stories, uh, to get opportunities to, to meet um, luminaries like Natasha Breed. Um, so really want to, you know, I just am grateful to our institutions of higher learning, learning like Saginaw Valley State University and Michigan State University, who um, who are really you know shining a light on history. So thanks everybody, and thank you Natasha for for everything. Thank you, thank you, and I'd like to say thank you to Jerry as well for inviting me in on an amazing opportunity. I'd like to say thank you to Ira Dorsey, Bootleg, and his family um, for the introduction to Jerry and um, the beginning of um, the opportunity to work on this amazing project. And here in Atlanta, I'd like to give a special thanks to Curtis Daniels, the owner of Patchwork Studio, who allowed us to record interviews here with some of our people, um, Ghetto Mafia, Xavier Roberts, Coalition DJs, um, I can't remember everybody. I'm kind of slipping my mind. And then we had camera crew that went out to L.A. and filmed too short for us. And so I'm grateful to all of the people that participated in the interviews, Fantasy Images, our film crew, and just the breed friends and family, the continued fan support. He's been gone 12 years and just the people have been there through the highs and the lows. And I really would like to extend an extreme sincere thank you and my appreciation to Jerry's film crew and her production team because because their compassion to our stories and to our time and and just our situation as you know editing our footage and they were extremely sensitive to me and my story as well as Breed and his legacy and I think they did an amazing job with editing and keeping the film intact and so I'm really proud of this work and to be a part of this team and so we're excited for where we can go uh, when this pandemic is over. Excellent. And thank you guys here as well for having yeah. us but jerry kind of covered that for me so thank you guys <laughs> yeah thank you both it's been great this has been a wonderful series um they'll be on our website if you haven't seen the other ones in the series they're on there as well um uh, we have had some great conversations and uh, uh it's kind of sad that it's all over this, this is well i was just going to say jeff so even though um when our physical exhibition gets deinstalled and carefully packed away. We are going to have this virtual exhibition, which, you know, is, um, it has actually even more um, resources and links available than the physical. I mean, it's, it's deeper um, than the, and, and more comprehensive than the in-person exhibition. That is going to remain on our website and archived for future, for, for future reference. This conversation is going to be added to that. If you all have things that you want us to add to that to make it a full, more full um, exhibition experience, we welcome that. I mean, we love the idea of this um, virtual exhibition as a living and breathing thing that can grow and uh, expand, but also be around for the future generations to look back on. So. Um, that's again on, on our website, marshallfredericks.org. And um, we, um, we welcome everyone to um, check it out and add comments. And um, thank you both so much for not just your time tonight, but for your, your contributions and for just opening up and, and sharing your, your personal stories, your professional processes, all of that. We, we truly, truly appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I hope everyone has a great night. Uh, oh, it looks like Joanna, did you put up a, a, a yes. survey? Um, there's a link, but of course, <laughs> anyone who registered will also um, send you the exhibition email so that you can win that signed poster. Hello, uh, Professor Griff from Public Enemy and, and uh, Professor Collins. So um, thank you all. Have a great evening. And um, hopefully we will cross paths again. Thank yes. you guys. It's been amazing. Have a great evening. Thank you. Yeah. You're both. Good to meet you both. Thank you. Good night.